Welcome to POTUS 2017, where we keep watch on the Oval Office and pour cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. Today a look ahead to the first hundred days of the Trump administration. Why the hundred day yardstick? Well it originated in the depths of the depression when President Franklin Roosevelt, holding Congress in session for three months, managed to sign 15 social, economic and job creating bills. Humorist Will Rogers said at the time, Congress doesn't pass legislation anymore. They just wave at the bills as they go by. Will Trump be as successful? Political scientist David Lewis will join us later to put Trump's 100-day agenda into historical context. One item in that growing agenda is, of course, the wall at the Mexican border. The rhetoric is about to become policy. Congress will be asked to front the money for it. How much? What would it take to seal the border? What's the engineering challenge? 600 miles of wall barriers and fences already exist. How effective are they? What security and environmental lessons can we learn from those existing barriers? Joining us via Skype from Nogales, Arizona, Dan Millis. Millis is an organizer with the Sierra Club's Borderlands campaign. He has worked against, also as part of his research, climbed border walls from California to Texas. And with us here in New York, structural engineer and freelance writer Alexander Weinberg, who understands how to build a high wall that won't blow over in a windstorm. Welcome to both of you. Hello. Hello. Good to be here. Uh, so Trump said at a campaign appearance in August that building the wall was, quote, very easy. I'm a builder. What's more complicated is building a building that's 95 stories tall. How much do you agree? Uh, zero. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. He's not a builder, first of all. I mean, he wouldn't know how to build a birdhouse. He's a developer. He pays other people to design things for him, or sometimes he doesn't pay them at all. Um, and furthermore, the, the idea that designing a 95-story a building is simpler than designing a wall might be true. However, we have organized our economy around uh, the idea that, that building a 95-story building might make sense. So in New York, we have a number of buildings that are that tall. I think there are 100 in the world that are that tall. That's really not going to make front-page news. However, a wall of this length has really been done once before in the history of our, of our species, the Great, the Great Wall, wall of, of China. China. That's yeah. thousands of miles long. Yes. Um, and How'd that's, they do it? Well, that, well, for one thing, that thousands of mile, uh, a mile long wall was built with uh, a really, really handy construction technique called uh, forced peasant labor. Um, and it also, people often think that the Great Wall of China is, is one wall. It's uh, a number of walls, I think five different campaigns that occurred over thousands of years. The most recent and the sort of the most famous and visible uh, iteration of the Great Wall of China is the Ming Dynasty Wall, which was built, uh, I think, from the, the, the 14th century until the 17th century. It took 280 years. I mean, if, if George Washington began building a border wall along, uh, along uh, the Texas border, he'd still be at it today if that same time frame were applied. Huh. So I see if you were hired to design the wall, and we're not politically opposed to doing so, which seems apparent that you are, um, that you've developed some schematics for how you would do it. And we're going to put one of those up right now. Let's take a look. Um, what are we seeing here? It looks like your, your idea is make the parts elsewhere, bring them there, and dig really deep. Yeah, so the idea is it makes no sense to use a lot of on-site labor in this kind of situation. A lot of the uh, you know, editorial cartoons and uh, visual graphics on uh, news program packages uh, depict the wall as a big brick wall. You know, that's what you think of when you think of a wall. In reality, it makes no sense to build like that. It makes no sense to build like the Great Wall of China 
uh, anymore. That doesn't make any sense. We don't want to use that kind of labor, so therefore it makes sense to assemble as much as you possibly can off-site in a controlled environment. So, so what are we looking here? So to, we're looking right here. Uh, untrained eye, it looks like graph paper. Yeah, this is, this is uh, uh, graph paper. Um, what you're seeing here are precast concrete panels. Uh, the lines running horizontal uh, are dividing precast concrete panels. The vertical elements are precast concrete columns. Uh, and essentially, the idea in this design for the, the border wall would be to uh, build your columns and your wall material, your precast uh, panels like, off-site, like the sound barriers along the highway. These would look like like these would look a lot like uh, highway sound barriers, which again also are are all precast and, and brought uh, onto the site. Um, the only problem is is that these things require foundations. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't just need 2,000 miles of wall, you need 2,000 miles of foundations. 2,000 miles of foundations means 2,000 miles of surveying. Is that part of what we're seeing here? Yeah, so we're seeing just a rough version of what a foundation uh, might look like. But you've got to keep in mind that you're not just supporting the weight of the wall. That's not really the key issue at all. The idea is that the taller you build, the more wind that wall is going to catch. Just because you're in the middle of the desert doesn't mean you can design a wall unable to sustain the lateral loads applied to it. This is basically a big sail. Right. That's how this will behave. As such, you're going to need to be able to resist that lateral loading in some way. That's where some sort of deep foundation comes in. All right, Dan Millis, thank you for your patience. You're <laughs> in Nogales, Nogal Arizona. Uh, what's the border like there? Well, we already have a wall on the border, and it's really important that people understand that. We've got 653 miles of barriers already constructed, and I'd say about half of that, 354 miles, is what I call a wall because it's tall. It's taller than any fence that I would ever construct in my yard, and it's made out of steel and concrete. And what we're seeing here on the ground is that the wall is causing problems with flooding. It's causing problems with blocking wildlife migrations or it can also fragment wildlife habitat and cut it into two. So these are the big environmental issues we have with the wall that's already been built, and those problems would only get worse under the Trump type of proposal. We have a couple of slides to show that maybe indicate what you were just talking about. Uh, it looks like the flooding is worse on the Mexican side of the wall here. In the Nogales area, because the the water flows from south to north, then yes, that's where the, the flooding occurs, is in Nogales, Sonora, in Mexico. But there are other places where the water flows north to south and we get flooding on the U.S. side, and that's the case west of here in uh, Organ Pipe Cactus National Monument in Lukeville, Arizona, where we've seen significant flooding on the U.S. side as well. I don't know if you can see the slide we're showing, but can you describe the wall here? By the way, this picture is from 2008 but can you describe the actual barrier? Sure, the barrier in Nogales is a, a tall bollard style barrier, meaning that these bollards or posts are about four inches apart. They're anywhere from 12 to 20 feet in height. And uh, there are also interspersed some solid walls that are kind of concrete with some metal mesh. That's probably what you're looking at right now. And all of that, um, you know, whether there's a mesh or a space between the posts, all of that gets blocked up with debris as soon as the floodwaters start to flow, and it becomes a solid dam. Now, the wall is not designed to be a dam, and so oftentimes when the water gets this deep, uh, like we see where the, the water got six feet deep in downtown Nogales, um, sometimes those walls will just fall over under that kind of pressure. Huh. And then that sends the floodwaters rushing into the other side, whether that's Mexico or, or United States. And here's that other slide. And in this one, we do see an example of wildlife. I think these are called mule deer, which me as a boy from Queens really doesn't know, but I read it. So what's being indicated here? Well, uh, these are some deer that are blocked by a wall that goes through the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. So that is a place that's been set aside, protected by federal law, uh, set aside for nature, protects the San Pedro River. And speaking of the San Pedro River, I just really want to stress that when people think of the border, they shouldn't think of a wall, they should think of a river. Because most of our U.S.-Mexico border is made up 
by the, uh, the Rio Grande in Texas. That's 1,200 miles of our 2,000 mile border. So we have nearly twice as much river on our border than barrier right now. And you know, who wants to build a wall in the middle of a river? I, I challenge anyone to give that one a shot. Huh. So now I understand why this is a concern of yours. Because when I first saw, oh, Sierra Club, interested in coming on to talk about the wall, I thought, this isn't an environmental issue, this is an immigration issue. So you've explained some of the environmental challenges. Would you say, from your standpoint down there in Nogales, that that area has a wall, or the Southwest in general, that is effective at stopping illegal crossings, which is the point? No, I think that what people should really understand is the wall doesn't work. In fact, when Senator McCain brought some of his colleagues down to Nogales to show off the wall, a woman climbed over it right in front of his group. And it happens every day. Uh, no matter how tall you build that thing, people are going to build ladders that are one or two feet taller. And that's just a fact of the matter. They, they don't stop people. They cause all these other problems. They cost millions of dollars per mile. The latest GAO, Government Accountability Office, report says $6.5 million per mile to build these things. And those are a lot cheaper, the walls we've built so far, than the kind of construction that Trump has proposed or that your guest is talking about. So, Mr. Weinberg, yes. what about the problem of the river that Mr. Millis laid out? You know, you can't build a wall so easily in the middle of the river. What would you do? I mean, you very well could build it. I don't think you should. Uh, you know, we've built much larger structures in, in rivers before. I don't, think, uh, I don't think any of us believe that it's a good idea to be building in the middle of a river. Um, so Trump has himself said like, oh, well, there are some natural barriers that we will leave aside. Perhaps in that, uh, in that list of natural barriers, he is considering, you know, leaving river, rivers out of the picture. Uh, but if they're uh, hard to navigate, if they're course. hard to navigate, I suppose. Yeah. But uh, from what I've seen from my visits down there, a lot of the portions of the Rio Grande River seem fairly easy to cross. Um, but uh, I, I don't particularly think it would be uh, it would be wise to build a wall in the middle of the river, but it is possible. What would the whole thing cost? You know, the Trump refrain during the campaign is we're going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay for yeah. it. Yeah. Now it seems like the American taxpayer is going to pay for it at first and he's going to try to get it back from Mexico in some way. But what would the cost be for the entire length of the wall done his way? Well, you have to consider that one of the most expensive things is going to be just acquiring the land for this project. A lot of this land does or, not belong to the government. lands are not, by definition, government lands? A huge portion of this land belongs to uh, the, uh, the Ahono, uh, um, oh, somebody please help me, the uh, Ahono uh, Odom tribe. Do you know, in, Dan Millis, what the name the, in, the uh, in Arizona. Is? Um, it's a Hona Atom Nation, yes. Yes, the, the, it's a 75-mile-long stretch of land through a, a, a Native American sovereign uh, territory. Uh, acquiring that land is going to take something, something else than money, something a lot bigger uh -huh. than money. It's not going to happen. But there is a significant amount of private lands, particularly in Texas, if I recall, uh, in this area, and just getting the land alone is going to be an incredible eminent expenditure. Eminent domain. Well, yeah, you could eminent domain people, but they can fight you, and, and there have been court cases of people who uh, have fought against the United States government in order right. to prevent walls being built on their land, and so, they last years. So Trump has a number, which is 10 to 12 billion. That's five times too little. Really? I think so. And, and I'll say this, though, is that that number might not matter because people on, uh, on his side of the argument would just say, well, it doesn't matter what the number is because Mexico is going to pay for it. So the number is almost immaterial. Do you want to tell us a little more, Dan Millis, about the Native American land issue since that's in your area? It sounds like you're familiar with it. Sure, I can. Um, but first, let me point out that in December, Homeland Security gave a report to the Trump transition team where they identified 413 miles along the Mexican border where they thought that additional walls could be built. And they put that number at $11.4 billion. That's for the type of fencing that we have today, which as your guest mentions, is a lot cheaper than the kind of uh, 
construction that, that Trump has mentioned. Now, uh, over on the Tona Atom Nation, just west of me, is uh, on their borderlands, they already have a fence, a steel and concrete vehicle fence that is designed to stop smuggling vehicles from crossing the border. And that's one of the few types of uh, barriers that actually seems to be effective in accomplishing its goal as a vehicle barrier. They do cut down on the number of drug smuggling vehicles that can cross the border, and they don't cut down on the amount of water that can flow across the border or the migrations of wildlife. And the, uh, the reason that a vehicle fence is on a Tana Atom Nation and not a wall is that because when Bush built his wall, the Tana Atom Nation tribal chairman said that a wall would be built on the Tana Atom Nation over his dead body. Mm. And, and that is a quote that continues today in the leadership of the Tana Atom Nation. So the North Dakota Sioux are an indication of the fight ahead if they were to do something like that. Last thought, yes. Mr. Weinberg, it sounds like you're not just daunted by the engineering and financial challenge, but that you're offended by the idea. Most Americans would say a country has a right to establish a border and decide who comes in. Uh, do you not accept that premise? Well, first of all, I want to say that it's not necessarily an engineering challenge as much as it is a logistical challenge. Uh, an en a good engineer could design a sort of typical modular wall panel system in an afternoon. But uh, I, I, I am, yes, offended by the idea of the wall uh, for, for, for many reasons that our guest uh, has, has pointed out, but also because we, you know, I'm a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers. We put out a report card every year of American infrastructure, and we're not in great shape. We have... Uh, essentially no high-speed rail system in this country. Spain, uh, Spain has 3,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. France has 2,000 kilometers. Germany has 2,000 kilometers. This country has zero. So it's about how we spend our infrastructure dollar given the choice. Go to LaGuardia Airport and think, how are we, why would we be stupid enough to spend a dime on anything other than improving our infrastructure that, that we use every day? This wall is a, is, a, is, a, is a flight of fancy. It appeals to a certain kind of people who have a certain political outlook. I don't think it would accomplish the task that it's meant to accomplish. I don't think it'd be nearly as easy to build as Mr. Trump does. And frankly, I think we have other more pressing priorities in terms of our spending and our engineering uh, uh, options. And quick last word, Mr. Millis. I think you've said if we're going to spend money at the border, it's better to spend it on other things. Absolutely. I mean, if we're concerned about smuggling and whatnot, we should look at the, the cash and the guns that are flowing south. That's what's fueling the violence south of the border. Um, we need to look at the real problems, the, the cuts that are going to have to happen in other areas. I don't know, health care, other government infrastructure in order to fund something like this. And people really should know that in addition to those 413 miles on the southern border, Homeland Security identified 452 miles on the Canadian border that would cost $3.3 billion to build walls there. I mean, this thing is out of control. We need to put a stop to it and, and put some real rational policies in place. Well, thank you both very much for joining us. I think now our viewers have a little better idea of the barriers to the barrier <laughs> that the president wants to build. Thank you both. Now we'll bring on some additional evidence about the first 100 days. for evidence-based politics, where we pour cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. Donald Trump, the businessman with no political experience and a tendency to set off controversy, has already proved the pundits and pollsters wrong by winning the presidency. Can he also fulfill the promises he made on the campaign trail? Like all new presidents, he's bound to be judged on his first 100 days in office. As we mentioned earlier, that yardstick originated in 1933 when, in his first 100 days, FDR managed to pass 15 social, economic, and job-creating bills. What's on Trump's agenda for his first 100 days? 
Well, last October in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, candidate Trump had quite a list. What follows is my 100-day action plan to make America great again. We will cancel all federal funding of sanctuary cities. We will begin removing the more than 2 million criminal illegal immigrants from the country. Middle Class Tax Relief and Simplification Act. The American Infrastructure Act. The Repeal and Replace Obamacare Act. And Illegal Immigration Act. Clean Up Corruption in Washington Act. And there's more where that came from, like imposing term limits on Congress, school choice, child care, taxes to end offshoring of corporate profits, and putting the next Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court. Come the last day of April, we'll know how much was actually accomplished. Historically, what's the batting average for new presidents? What's the key to swimming in the swamp? Joining us, David Lewis, professor and chair of the political science department at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee, among his books, Presidents and the Politics of Agency Design. He joins us on Skype from Nashville. Hi, Professor. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. The idea of the first 100 days, was it a nice round number marketing ploy by FDR or something else? It, I don't think it actually was exactly 100 days. 100 days is a good round number. It certainly was an expectation that he was going to get things done right away. And then in retrospect, it got reified by historians and subsequent presidents. So 15 bills, job creation, social and economic legislation is a lot. I'm curious how President Obama's first 100 days compares, because he also came in at the depths of a financial crisis that a lot of people compared to FDR. Yeah, I think uh, most modern presidents don't quite hold to the standard that FDR did. I think uh, it's harder to get legislation enacted these days. I think President Obama was successful in terms of getting the stimulus bill passed and responding to the economic crisis in a similar way as FDR, but it wasn't the flurry of legislation that FDR um, initiated in 1933. How about George W. Bush? How quickly we forget we think of him as the post-9-11 president, and that happened in his first year in office, but that was after his first 100 days. What did he launch with? Yeah, well, he was, very he was in a difficult circumstance, somewhat different, actually. There wasn't the same type of crisis. He had the sort of um, difficulty of legitimacy hanging over his head because of the close election with Al Gore and the lengthy time it took to, to resolve those things. Most people think, however, his transition was pretty successful, and his first 100 days was successful, although the marker that's often used is how quickly did you get your team in place and how quickly did administrative actions uh, come into place. Well, you're an expert on that. You wrote a book about agency building. I've been hearing these last few days that Trump is way behind other presidents in building the various executive agencies, partly because he didn't think he was going to win. So <laughs> how are you assessing that? Well, I, I'll, I'll give him some good marks at the beginning. That is, I think that he was pretty uh, good historically in terms of his naming of uh, people for his cabinet. He was pretty quick to name a chief of staff in the White House and some senior advisors in the White House. So naming people quickly, I think he did pretty well relative to presidents before him. Where things are, where the rubber is going to meet the road in terms of um, whether he's been successful or not is what happens with these nominees? Do they get confirmed quickly? And then there's a second level of appointments. So we think about the executive departments, but below that level are, are very important positions, people that run the Food and Drug Administration or the Centers for Disease Control or the Federal Aviation Administration. And the difficulty for the Trump team is, if we didn't do that work in advance, um, are we going to be able to fill those positions quickly enough? Um, and certainly there are important positions there, counterintelligence, FEMA, places like that. Is there a best example of the first 100 days other than FDR? Well, it depends on what metric you want to evaluate. Certainly, FDR is hard to, um, uh, hard to beat when it comes to legislative activity. I think we're, we're doing pretty well now in terms of the transition of power between presidents. So in FDR's day, it was an icy relationship often between the outgoing president and the incoming president and cooperation on national security and those types of things. We're much better at that now because the 
handoff is much more complicated. Um, certainly FDR did terrifically well with regard to legislation, um, but the job is much bigger now and there's a lot more involved. It's executive action, it's nominations, it's foreign policy, it's, it's legislation. How much does having Congress controlled by the same party as the president make all the difference? I think it makes a big difference. I mean, any time a new president comes into office, uh, even if they're from the same party, you're going to get some change because that person needs to establish their own legacy, their own reputation, um, their own standing in the Washington community. But having uh, a president of the same party as Congress makes a big difference, partly because it takes some of the load off the new president. So I guarantee you that Speaker Ryan and uh, Majority Leader McConnell have an agenda already in place, a piece of legislation they've wanted to get enacted, but they couldn't get enacted because the sitting president was a Democrat. So they'll push those things through, which means stuff will happen, but it might not necessarily have to be pushed by the president. And how much is the activity and the success of generating activity in the first 100 days predictive of the overall success of the administration in enacting its agenda? The first hundred days is only a few months. A term, obviously, is four years. Well, I think that a good analogy is sort of like running a, a long race, right? You can stumble out of the blocks and you can still recover, uh, but there's a lot more work to do if you don't take advantage of that sort of early start. Um, so the concern for presidents is I'm never going to have more political capital than I have right now. Congress is never going to be more differential than they are to me right now. And so if I don't take advantage of this window of opportunity, I'm really going to be set back. It's not that I can't recover, but it really is a missed opportunity. How much harder do you think that's going to be for Trump, if it is, than with other presidents? He's got Republican control of the Congress, but he's got an approval, approval rating only around 40 percent, historically low for an incoming president. Yeah, he's an interesting case. I think what's distinctive about him, as you said, is he's got relatively low approval coming in, right? So most presidents... Uh, elect after they get elected, they give a series of speeches and statements. We need to bring the country together again uh, and try to unify the country around the president elect's agenda and provide a sense that there is a common um, agenda or mandate for what should happen next. President elect Trump has not done that. He's not actively tried to court um, the support of people that didn't support him during the campaign and has generated, in some ways, resistance to his to his agenda. So it takes away a little bit of the luster and public pressure that helps presidents in the first 100 days. Well, if the past 100 days and the past year and a half is prologue, we're in for a wild ride over the next 100 days. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. And that's POTUS 2017 for today. We're here each week at this hour pouring cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. And trust me, for the next four years, that kind of talk will not be in short supply. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.